let me introduce uh, the panelists for uh, this evening. Uh, we have uh, James Ibo uh, from Nigeria, uh, who's a lawyer and human rights uh, activist. And I think you're soon going to be doing some uh, work for the IHEU, uh, the International Human Settlement Union at uh, the uh, African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Uh, so a colleague, I'm sorry, I'm Bob Churchill from the International Humanist uh, and Ethical Union uh, as well. Uh, we have uh, Aisha uh, 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 Bengum uh, here, uh, who is uh, from the uh, London Ex-Muslims. Uh, we have uh, Yamisi Alassani, who is a blogger, uh, feminist, uh, atheist, and LGBT activist. Uh, we have, uh, you've already seen from Babu, oh, he's not on the panel, okay, no Babu on the panel. And uh, we have Justin Bahunga from Afruka. African uh, Genetic and Child Abuse. Uh, so he's the project coordinator and lead on faith-based child abuse with a focus on fighting against branding children as witches uh, or possessed as evil uh, spirits. And their, uh, their mission, their, their stance, is that culture and religion should never be a reason to abuse children. Uh, and of course, you've already met uh, uh, Le uh, Leo Egwe, who, uh, who is a former uh, West Africa represent representative also for IHEU uh, and is uh, currently uh, researching witchcraft. Uh, at, uh, is it Beirut University? Beirut. Beirut. Not Beirut, because Not Beirut, Beirut. Beirut. Yeah. will take you to yeah. Lebanon. Wrong place. <laughs> Very wrong uh, place. Um, Leo was talking about encouraging people to act on this, and this, this threat as well of the return of witchcraft, uh, as it was, as it were, return of this kind of violent religion uh, to um, London. And very recently, Leo brought to our attention in the offices in, in London, the return of Helen of Pabio, and I thought to myself, well, you, you know in America they had those wristbands, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I was like, what would Leo Igwe do? <laughs> so we organized a protest about that visit from Helen of Pabio. They got her moved out of the venue that she'd booked, she'd deceptively booked that venue that wasn't <clears throat> never, never supposed to be there. They told her it was a different kind of event. We said, this is, is a witchcraft event, and they went, okay, get out. Uh, so she moved somewhere else. So we, we went, oh, that's, that's difficult. What are we gonna do now? We need to find out where she's gone. What would Leo Igwe do? <laughs> so I phoned them up, and I said, there's a number on the flyer. So I phoned them up and said, uh, hello, uh, I'm very interested in this witchcraft event that you have going on. Uh, please tell me more about it, and where is, where is the venue? And they obviously, they got wise to the fact that people in London didn't want them because they'd already been turfed out of one venue, so they weren't having it. She said, oh, what's your name? Which, which church are you from? And uh, when you, when you come, I said, I went, oh, <coughs> bye. Uh, <laughs> wasn't going to work. Um, and other people tried to get involved. Uh, I think Debbie from Africa, she, she, was, in, she was involved. Uh, all of us talking online, no one could find this thing. So having moved from one venue, good news, she now can't tell anyone where her second venue is. <laughs> Bad news, we can't find her to protest. <laughs> we can't get the media there. It just went on for a whole day until I was like, uh, there's nothing uh, more to do. Fortunately, I spent a little time with the Uganda humanists. I was there for a year, picked up a little bit of an accent. Not very proud of it, but I picked up the phone. <laughs> and I went, <clears throat> uh, uh, hello? My name is Joseph Bambale. <laughs> very interesting. And Straight away, immediately, she said, oh, I tell you where the venue is. Straight away. Uh, okay, so uh, we got, uh, we got uh, Helen uh, out of the country, or she couldn't do her uh, thing because we weren't able to turn up and uh, protest. But as Leo said, we have Oya Depot coming anyway. Um, we have, we've written to the Home Secretary. Yeah. We have had, we had, had an answer, mm -hmm. but as far as of yet, they haven't said no. He's not coming. But the same thing happened with Helen. Uh, the Home Secretary wrote back and said, oh, I can't, I can't tell you because it's about a private individual. So, mm -hmm. okay, you can't tell us if you deported them or, if, or whatever, if you have any concerns. Um, but we wrote also to uh, the, lead, the, the opposition and they went, yeah, we, yeah, we deported her. So who knows? They, they don't even know whether they deported her or not. But she left the country, so we can, we can hope that we had some effect on her getting out. Um, all right, so do we have questions for all our wonderful panelists? Yeah. This is particularly a question for Leo. Just to say, your talk was so entertaining. I've not had that much fun for a long time. Um, 
I've not heard a lot of talk here about, so I'm from the exorcism community as well, and uh, we have Lucaya, which is sort of, uh, it's exorcism as well. I've not heard a lot of talk about mental health, which is in Britain, a lot of the Lucaya is to do with mental health. So is that, this, is that very different in, 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 in Ghana, or is it, is it, yeah, what's up with that? Oh yeah, um, when I refer to health, I meant health in all, all ramifications. Whether it's mental health, whether it's physical health, whether it's back pain, whether it's, um, you know, um, sometimes cholera, um, guinea worm infection, you know, as long as it happens in a community where people, you know, um, maybe don't have access to treatment, so there's always a tendency for them to evoke or start making accusations. So. Mental health is just part of, or, or ill health as a result of maybe mental problem or something, it's just part of it. It's just part of the whole thing. And uh, if you have uh, been following the BBC, that should be some months ago, they talked about that in chart. Due to lack of psychiatric doctors, you know, many people are using witchcraft narratives now to explain mental health problems in chart. You know, if you put it on the Google, you will find it, mental health and the uh, witchcraft accusation in charge, you'll find it. So, so as long as there's some illness that people cannot explain, whether it's mental, whether it's material, or physical, or whatever, people always evoke the case of witchcraft, yes. Does anyone else in the panel want to respond to that? Yes, I just wanted to add that uh, from experience, most of the cases of child abuse we've come to deal with, especially cases where the children actually, or the young people actually confess to witchcraft. By the time we take them before a psychiatrist, we discover that they have one mental health problem or the other. We had a case of about, close to about seven cases I personally witnessed. They were diagnosed of schizophrenia. Then we had one that, we had many that the children would actually say, well, I was led to say, they were beating me, so I confessed to witchcraft. Then some who, after a medical examination, they will be discovered to have mental disorder. The reason is that until I started studying law, I didn't know when you're sick, because I grew up in the southern part of Nigeria, and you have, when you have a mental disorder, because I knew so many people in my village, in my community that had mental problems, but I didn't know they had any place they can be treated. So the whole of um, southern Nigeria, we have two psychiatric uh, hospitals, like in Calabar, we have a psychiatric hospital. But when you go there, um, I met a psychiatrist for the first time when I started working as a lawyer. And they uh, started um, doing cases of child abuse. So the issue of mental health and no facility to deal with mental patients is also helping the churches, the pastors, to make more money. Because somebody has, is, has a mental problem. And they conclude that, well, since the doctor, the conventional doctors, who treat us of malaria cannot solve the mental problem, then the person is a witch or wizard. So it's a big problem. And then um, maybe, and it's a problem science has addressed. It can be managed, but we conclude that it is witchcraft. Um, um, maybe we want to look, uh, look at this from another direction. I would just like to say that uh, not all, in, we've had cases, I've had cases of people saying, uh, you're saying there are no wishes, but this woman convinced, confessed to being a wish. What do you say to that? I would like to say that it's not always a case of mental illnesses, because when we have uh, Christians, Muslims, saying, you, they, saying they can hear God, they, can be, they hear the voice of God, the Holy Spirit is talking to them, it doesn't really mean they are mentally sick. It's just the normal situation of the society. They, they, they believe in the society that has been inculcated in them. I've had cases, I, I grew up being accused of being a wish, I've also been a prophetess, and that doesn't mean I've, I've had any mental problem. And I've, I've prophesied to people before and tell them what will happen in the future. It has nothing to do with being a wish or a wizard, a wizard or having a mental problem. It's basically a, a, a product. I'm a product of my society. You accumulate things in your society. I've had cases in my family where oh, I've had a problem with one of my sisters. We're always fighting. And I was like, you're a wish. Oh, you're a wish. And in the language, you, don't, you know what? I'm a wish. She said she's a wish. 
And she said, look, in my dream today, I dreamt that I had, uh, I was actually the head of the witches, and I was, I have some superpowers. Then you have to also understand this in the context. You know, when I discuss this with her now, we laugh, but it wasn't funny then. But you have to look at the context of where she got this from. The society is always telling children they are witches, it's telling women they are witches, it's telling old women they are witches. And you also look at this issue of superheroes, superpowers. People having, oh, I want to be a Superman, I want to be Batman, I want to be, I want to be Wonder Woman. Those are science fiction, it's okay to have superpowers. So when you send a child that she has superpowers, that uh, although she's using the power for evil, then the way this child may retreat into herself and actually start believing, I've got this power. So when she tells you, yeah, you know what, I'm a witch and I'm going to deal with you if you don't give me your candy. I'm going to deal with you if you don't do my homework for me. It is sort of growing a superpower. And in that society, they call it witch. So when a child tells you, oh, maybe I'm a witch, or maybe I've had so much torture, that doesn't actually mean they have mental problems. You have to look at it from the context of the society they grew up in and how we have been battered with this issue that you have a problem, you are a witch. And of course, pastors make a lot of money from it, accusing children of being witches, beating them up. A pastor told my mom I was a witch simply because I, I started questioning. I was a prophetess to them before, but when I started questioning things and I was exposing things I didn't agree with, I said, I think your child has been taken over by the witches, by the evil force and all that. So I wasn't no more the anointed child of God, but now the anointed child of Satan. So really, and it's not that if your parents hate you when they start saying, no, oh, maybe we should take her to the beach and beat her and pray for her and all that. It, it's their own way of showing love because that is what they believe in. So it's not always a case of mental problem but actually a product of the society. So wishes are not, who people confess that they are wishes, they have a product and, uh, of their society, not necessarily a mental problem. You, you mentioned there this problem of the fact that we have this distinction. There are some people accused of being witches, like the kind Lara's tend generally working with victims of it. And then on the other hand, you have this problem of like witch doctors, god, god men in, in India. And sometimes we don't seem to have the language, we just talk about there's a problem with witchcraft. And I think the terminology for this whole field almost hasn't settled down yet because it's not talked about enough. So we say, we say things like um, uh, a witch camp, and you know, someone that just hears that, if they are in that mindset of thinking they're a witch, then they might think that's the place where the witches go. Mm -hmm. We know it's for the victims of yeah. accusers, yeah. but it's, it's confusing language. And we talk about witch doctors, mm -hmm. and whether you believe in the magic or not, people still call them a witch doctor. Mm -hmm. So I think the way that we talk about this as activists and campaigners mm -hmm. is confused, mm -hmm. and that we sometimes run together these two very different issues of, of mm -hmm. people who rip people off, mm -hmm. fraudsters mm -hmm. and con men or mm -hmm. confused people who say they are doing magic, mm -hmm. and the problem of victimization. I mean, to what extent, yep. in your work, to what extent does does this, this, this parallel track of the, there are people accused of it, and there are people saying that they practice it, to what extent does all that, and the tradition of it, the healers, uh, traditional healers, to what extent does that mean that it kind of validates the language of witches and make it harder? Thank you. My name is Justin Senna from Afro Africa and United Against Child Abuse. And you know there is another presentation of black children in the care system. And one of the things of the abuse is, is linked with certain cultural values and the practices. And that's why I work on one of the things that we deal with is actually accusations of children as witches or possessed by evil spirits. Well, I think, but I think, before I start, I want to know one thing, that actually, when you speak of Africa, Africa is not a village. So, so I don't want to go with, a, with an exp kind of an image that actually Africa is one place where everything is happening. If you take a country like Nigeria, we've got about 200 tribes or, or nationalities, Congo would be the same. And so, and that's why the word witch, which is a, an English word, and if I ask to describe it, it can mean something to many people. And that's why the, the work we do, for instance, in, in our work, how for a child who goes to a social worker and they say they called me a witch, they say, what's the problem? But they don't understand the, what is the lying behind this accusation of a witch, the thing they had described. And for us are concerned, that is first and foremost, it's an emotional abuse. We are also accusing somebody, a child, of being an evil person. So, and so, so this word actually, they depend on our cultural values and the practice how, how it is meant. And the other part of it, I think, what you have to know, Africa is not a village. They have all different ways, they have the same, the same country could have different beliefs, different ways of expressing their beliefs. The other part of it is actually, is again, I think we have to be 
a little bit careful in, in, in your campaign because not every church does abuse in their churches. I think saying that, I think we are risking to make a generalization which actually makes things more difficult. So therefore, and it, thirdly, what we are saying, what we are concerned, of course we are different. Our angle is you can believe whatever you want, but you cannot use your belief to harm somebody and each other for that matter. And that's our basic line. And of course, what we do, like we say we use the carrot and the stick. The carrot is you are harming a child and it is a counterproductive because we know you love your child so dearly. What you are doing is counterproductive. <coughs> the child is not your property. And of course, the other part is education because one of the things they use to, to say a child is a witch is bad behavior. So if you teach a parent that the child development shows that the behavior is normal child development, then you are changing the behavior of the child without having to confront the child. And therefore, we think that this is, the stick is, if you don't do that, there is a law. And we have been campaigning for the law to make it an offense for anyone to call the child a witch or possess by evil spirits. And that's, and that's very crucial. Yeah. So again, I think the, the best word which you can translate is believing in supernatural powers that they can manipulate or manipulate by people to do, what, to do good or to do evil. Once you take that as a definition, then it will come to any, you can use it anywhere. And by the other point I want to make is actually, belief in witchcraft or supernatural powers is not unique to Africa. You have, you, you will know that for instance now, you will have Suffolk, which, which, which for a training, there's a training in, in Suffolk, there's a training school, then online training, They've got spirits in this country. They've got Dr. Dr. Eddie Fire who has wrote a book, then quite dead. But actually, they still call it spirit attachment. Not, not, not witchcraft, but the thing they describe is exactly what you attribute witchcraft. They have got many clinics in this country. They have got, they have got clinics where there's healing at a distance. So it's, it's not this exotic African cultural value that is a lack of education. I've got doctors here. I've got spiritists. The spirit movement. We actually have got doctors finished in Yale University who actually have that. There's a spiritualist movement in Latin America, medical association, which are the fastest growing uh, religion in Latin America. These are not these are intellectuals. So it is not actually an issue of exotic in the forest of Africa, Nigeria. It is real. And it is, it is growing in this country. And I've got that spiritualist foundation you can train, they have all two days training, you can train to become exorcist. So we have to go beyond, actually we have to look African, look black or Indian, and the other part of it is when you have the exact the part relationship. To the Middle Ages, towards the women because they are weak. Today, in Africa, children was, right in my part of the world, of Africa, it was not an issue. It has become an issue. In the Congo, there has been war, but has been. Uh, HIVs, they have got a lot of children who can then take care of. They have been working in the streets because they can't, they can't read over them. And 20,000 in the case of Jinshasa, 80% of them, they are accused of witchcraft. Why? Socioeconomic conditions. So if you have to tackle it, apart from teaching, you have to tackle the triggers which lead to accusations. Yeah. War, conflict, economic betterment. Otherwise, if you go, I mean, to, to have to attack the intellectual part of it, you might not succeed. I think it's a very good point. There's been accusations in the last year that I can think of uh, in Papua New Guinea, Nepal, Pakistan, India. And I think sometimes, for some reason, it, it is, we do talk about witchcraft accusations in uh, Africa. And for some reason, uh, we don't think about, you know, we think about the godmen in India, but we don't think about the rural villages where actually witchcraft accusations are a problem. Um, to, um, can you speak to the, this problem in, in a broader ex-Muslim yeah. context? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, within the Indian ex-Muslim context, so there's two things. There's firstly the problem of witchcraft hunting in India. But there's also within the Muslim community, even here, some, um, something that you mentioned, uh, belief in possession and exorcism. So I'm going to use just the English terms just to keep it simple. So um, possession and exorcism. Um, so I'll talk about those two things separately. Um, in India, the there was a study done about two years ago by um, a research body 
in the, the, the US which showed that it's about 25,000 women have been killed in India as a result of being accused of witchcraft and these are normally done in really horrific ways so they're not just killed they're usually tortured first so um, some of the common forms this takes is they're uh, forced to strip naked and then paraded, hum humiliation. Um, forced to, I'm, I'm like, I'm sorry, this is really unpleasant, but forced to eat their own excrement. excrement to, you know, that's the nicest language I can use. Forced to drink their own urine. Um, and then usually beaten till they're unconscious. And um, if that doesn't work, well, then they just burn them alive. And um, there's been quite a few high-profile cases of this. But it's a common problem, and the reason that it's not highlighted more is because there's no national legislation against it. If you report it, nothing is done. Um, and the most common victims of these are, and you know, this is one of the reasons I don't visit India anymore, because it's women like me, <laughs> what they would class as rebels. So these are women who will fight for rights or will claim rights that people think that they don't have or will claim rights that actually they do have in law, but that society doesn't recognize that they have. So the right to inherit property, for example. Um, it's often being used um, against women who have not, like, who've been advanced sexually and who've rejected that advance. Um, and the way it works is, uh, they are, I think, similar to what was mentioned earlier. There are village chiefs in these areas, and it's their job to identify the witches. But if you're a really rich, powerful man, and you've been spurned by, you know, this some poor Indian girl, it's really easy for you to go to the village chiefs, bribe them, the whole society, you know, in, in that, in, especially in rural areas, ones and bribes, and you can basically buy an admission that someone is a witch. So that happens. Um, and then within the Muslim context, it's not just witchcraft that um, is a problem, it's also, if there's anything sort of unnatural about someone in, that, you know, unnatural in, a, in, in their version of the word, then there will be classes being possessed by something called a jinn. I don't know if any of you know what jinns are, but yeah, okay. So for those of you who don't know, these are mentioned in the Quran. Uh, Muslims believe that they are created by God out of smokeless fire, and they believe that um, they're, you know, they can be good or bad, but the bad ones will possess someone. And um, you know, o o over my lifetime, the list of things that are a sign that someone is possessed, I, I think most people can can say that they've been through something like that in, in their lifetime. So for example, one of the ones I was told was, if you have an adverse reaction to listening to the Quran, then you're probably possessed. Well, I'm an ex-Muslim. There are certain parts of the Quran that yes, I have an adverse reaction to. No, that does not mean I'm possessed. Um, and another thing, you know, my friend, she was staggering home one day and they thought that she was possessed. No, she was drunk. So, <laughs> You know, things like hallucinate, and the mental health part kicks in because things like hallucinations, hearing voices, and, and I know they're not always a sign of mental illness, but often what happens is when those things do occur, people go and they see an imam, they go to the mosque and they find a solution there, and so if it is a mental health problem, it's not captured. So, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, can we go to another question from the floor? Yeah. Thank you. Mine is not a question, but a contribution towards the issue of uh, which, or I will go by the other one, definition, means because uh, where my name is Ami, I'm from the Gambia, a women's rights organization called Gamkotra. Um, I want to bring it in the context of sexuality and reproductive health, where a, a young girl, a baby girl, is caught and she's bleeding, and they don't take her to the hospital. And when she faints, they said some supernatural powers possess her. And mostly, who has the supernatural power is an old woman who is poor. That's why the context different differs from one community to the other. She is usually the poor. She is usually the one with less uh, family influence, where her family is not uh, very strong in the, in the community. And these are the people who are identified as witches and they are the ones who cause that baby girl or young girl to suffer to suffer to, to, to death or not being able to survive that bleeding. Um, and the other set, uh, part where the issue of witches and supernatural mythical issues come in is when the girl grows up, she has been sealed during that process of female genital mutilation. So her vaginal orifice has been closed up. 
So no sexual penetration can take place. So what happens when they've forgotten that they've done that for her when she was a baby, or when she was a little girl of three, four years old? She grows up as a young teenager again, at the age of 13, 14, 15, they force her to marry a man two, three times her age, who comes, they take her there for marriage, he cannot sexually penetrate her, they will accuse the man that he is sexually important. Why? Because he cannot penetrate. They've forgotten that something has gone wrong along the way. If she survived that, and she happens to get pregnant, because on that day they will have to go and call, call the old woman who stealed her years ago. If she is there, they will look for another one who will come, cut her open, force the man to have sexual relations with her. And then, if she happens to get pregnant in that process, the next stage of where the witch and the supernatural will wait for her is when she is given birth. Because she is young, she is not matured physically, to be able to carry pregnancy to the stage of proper delivery, and then she suffers during that delivery, and they say, the witchcraft. Who is the witch? The old woman, the poor, the powerless in the society. So the issue of sexuality and reproductive and witches also exists in communities like ours in the Grammy. It's very interesting hearing about the, how, how you know, one form of abuse will trade off another and feed into it and, and make recur and, and make it um, worse. You mentioning that um, the the old women and the and the and the vulnerable. We often hear of uh, Leo. You mentioned uh, cases where actually what's going on is a family finds it a convenient way of shelving an old person and getting them out of the way. Um, but I think m people are most shocked when parents are involved with their own children yeah. when they're so easily convinced. Uh, yeah. Can you can you speak yeah. to that? Yeah. I think again. I think there is uh, what I'm trying to make is. People are, how can somebody do so much harm to a child who loves so much? That is, I think, the key question. But the issue is, the innocent child you are calling innocent is no longer innocent. Actually, once you say the child is a witch, you have dehumanized that child. You have a good child for moral consideration, because she's no longer the innocent, she's the, the evil person, he's the criminal. And therefore, it doesn't deserve any moral consideration. That's why we are saying the mere fact of saying that child is a witch, we have already abused the child emotionally. Secondly, it is incitement to hatred. Because once you say it's an evil person, people will hate the child. Secondly, it will be incitement to violence. But what they do, the process is, once possessed, the first thing we need to pray. If it doesn't work, what they call beating the devil out of the child. And I are not beating the child, they are beating the devil or the, even the child to get the child out until the child dies. But they are thinking they are doing good to the child. They are getting evil out of the child. And that's what you have to understand. First of all, moral exclusion. And the second, incitement. And the third, a victim, actually the parent becomes a victim. And that's why we have a program called Supporting Victims in the Family. Because the, the child is a victim, and the parent who does that to a child is a victim. And that's sadly, sometimes taken, by the, taken to court and put in prison. And the community itself is a social exclusion. They cannot go to the shop around. The other siblings, they can no longer touch a child. There was a case of a Congolese after school, a child was said to be a witch, or to went for the school. So it's a community issue again. So therefore, this, so why is it happen that the child was from the case that we talked about? You know what happened? It was, it was killed by the sister and brother-in-law, and other siblings were involved. What did they do? They smashed him with four, or four tiles, used a hammer to, to smash his teeth. There was a princess to rip off his ears. And this, and they had come to visit him on a Christmas day. So that shows you actually how we feel it should be an offense, human offense, to brand a child as a witch opposed by evil spirits. You are condemning somebody. Can we go back to the, uh, the floor? Any more questions? Oh. Um, my question is to you and to everyone else here, really. Um, all the work you've been doing, have you 
um, attempted to address these issues through governments and lawmakers. Because, um, I mean, the way things are going, in as much as you can talk about what people are doing, but, I mean, you always have the carrot and you always have the stick approach where, in fact, you know, is there any law that says you can accuse someone of being a witch or actually or mistreating someone by being accused of being a witch or actually getting the police to act and raising it through other um, government agencies? Okay, can we, can we also take a question down, down here as well so we have two to float around? Thank you. Um, this is for um, any of the panelists. Um, you talked about how the Humanist Society um, Association was able to, well, deport Elena Kwame from the UK, or it was actually she was escorted, I think. That was what I heard. Um, well, um, in terms of, well, we do have pastors in the UK who perform, who conduct all these meetings, prayer meetings to exercise you know, which is out of children or people or family. You know, it's common in, within the Congolese communities and it's also um, common in many Nigerian churches. Um, for one, Pastor Dia, who I think was featured in um, the Channel 4 Dispatches program where um, he said to exercise on which he, ha he had to sleep with a lady for over six times. And he said, well, it's not me sleeping with you, you know, it's the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit you know, having sexual intercourse, and you have to do this so many times to have, to for you to be delivered. Um, but then he's still in the UK, um, and he's been, he's been in the news several times for not only um, the so-called um, exorcism, but also baby factories as well, where women are um, taking, they go to Africa, a part of Africa, and then they're given portions to drink, and they tell them, well, it's a miracle baby, so you don't, you don't need to get a scan, you don't need anything, come back nine months later and you'd have a child, and, yes. or, or less. And you know, they get, you know, they, they travel back to a very, to, you know, a shamble, a shack somewhere in Africa, and, and they, well, from most of the cases, um, which, because um, we have, um, we have a working group on baby factory. I work at Africa as well, and I coordinate the anti-trafficking project. So we, there's a working group, a baby factory working group, where we're trying to see how this actually happens and how this um, intelligent, you know, highly educated couple do believe that um, a traditional doctor somewhere or a spiritualist somewhere in Africa would convince you that you know you have a real baby, so you don't need to go to get your scan done. Just come back nine months, and you're given something. You pass out, you wake up, and then you find a baby, and then you believe that you know you actually gave birth to the child. Is there anything you're doing to stop? or to bring to the forefront these type of issues and therefore pastors in the UK who are actually practicing search, especially in Nigeria. Is there anything else you're doing to stop or to bring it to the attention of lawmakers so that they can face, you know, proper prosecution? Sorry, we have two questions. Have you been lobbying governments outside the country to create new law, but also what is going wrong with the enforcement of the law here in the UK as well to those based in the UK? Two questions. Do you want to answer the no, first? No, no. James is a lawyer. Let's start, let's start with him. In the UK. James, yeah. It's your, so it's your, it's Leo's job to go into the villages. It's your job to push the law, yeah? <laughs> Lobbying. Yes. The, before 2000 and, uh, 2008, when uh, Mas Gavin and his team came and they, the video that we shot in Channel 4, dispatches uh, of witches, the, before then, it was many lawyers, including judges. We didn't know that the law in Nigeria, the Criminal Code Act, actually criminalizes anybody branding any person, not just a child. A child is a person, witchcraft, or even claiming to have power to exorcise witchcraft. Now, when we had those cases, it's difficult. We tried to look for the law that we will use to protect these children. So I started doing the research, and I found the law. The law is older than Nigeria. It was the colonialist that brought it in 1914. Because I also checked the history. I, I tried to use it. The police said no, that you can't use it because this law says you should punish the witches. They misinterpreted it. Now, I brought case law, by, which came from England. I said, look, this is what the case law is saying, that if you claim to have the power to exercise witchcraft, 
or you claim you have the power of witchcraft to harm others, you're a criminal. You should be prosecuted. So all these pastors that have been branding children and people witches are criminals. They should be prosecuted. They said no. So it was difficult for us to take it from the police to the courts. Because the police, normally, if you commit a crime, it is a crime against the state. So it is not individual prosecuting, but the state prosecuting. So all you need to do is just to lobby the state to prosecute. It was not working. What we now do is that if you harm a child uh, in the course of exorcism, you are charged for battery, assault. You know, we try doing that, but usually these pastors, these exorcists are powerful in our community, so they pay money. There's a lot of corruption. So for about three years, we had no single conviction. Now when, for, because of the, uh, the documentary by Mas Gavin, the state government, the Nigerian government were terribly embarrassed. They set up an inquiry in Akwa Ibom State to demolish our accession, to tell the world that, look, oh, these men are lying, because we doc documented over 800 cases of child witchcraft-related abuses, many of them dead. We showed them pictures and cases. Many of them never, many of the children were killed. We went to, we documented their names, how they were killed, where they were buried. The inquiry took us to UK. They did all that, but they, they, the report was never published. But what the government did was that they now brought a law that now explains deeply what the provisions we had in the Criminal Code Act attempted to do. Now we have a law, but the problem is you don't get prosecution. For instance, for the past uh, five years we've been um, doing uh, um, pro promoting and protecting children of uh, witchcraft uh, related abuses. We've had only about two convictions. Meanwhile, we've documented over 100 cases of witchcraft-related abuses. Now, why are we not succeeding? If it is rape, we have so many convictions for rape, stealing, other assault. But witchcraft, which the law has specifically made provisions for, no conviction. The reason is that the pastors are powerful, they have a lot of resources, and sometimes the judges and magistrates are very reluctant to even do those cases. So they give, you can do a case for two, three years, now, the accused persons are granted, they, they jump, they, they disappear. It's not that we don't know where they are, but the policeman who should carry out the arrest is very reluctant because if you, ah, he did the arrest last time, and when he went, went to him, his leg was swollen. <laughs> or the judge was driving to court, and he had a mild accident, or even a serious accident. Then it means the, 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 the witness, the police witness, or the prosecutor witness, may have caused the accident because he or she was accused of witchcraft. So these are the problems we keep having. Mm. Like there was a matter of the bishop, Bishop Olubuya, future in that thing. It got to a point where the state, a very a director and minister of justice, refused to do the prosecution. The state gave me a fiat to continue prosecution. The reason was that the prosecutor was scared that each time he's going for the matter, he see that he develops headache, or his leg is swollen or something. There is this fear, and this fear is created by this exorcist or these pastors. It's funny, since 2008, the law came to, uh, 2008, yes, it was in 2008 that we had the child rights law uh, in, in Aquaibon State. Then in Crossover State, it was the child rights um, 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 act, uh, law of 2009. No pastor has been prosecuted, but every day, Every day, walk into any church. We have so many churches in a street of about 500 meters. You can have, if you have 10 houses, six of those houses are churches. Now, enter any of those churches, they are talking about witchcraft. They are branding or attempting to exorcise witchcraft. None of them have been arrested because the policemen, the judges, also believe that these children, these old people are witches. So the problem is not the law. The problem is the will. Now, what we expect humanists, atheists, skeptics, and agnostics to do is to continue to raise the awareness that look, I, I, I enjoy the documentary by Babu on, look, this thing is just, um, it's a trick. They do this to raise money for themselves. That's why you can see Bishop Oyedepo has two jets. He's one of the richest pastors in Africa, and maybe in the world. How does he make his money? 
tells you, look, I can solve your problem spiritually. Give me the physical money, I'll give you spiritual money. And people believe these things, and they do them. Now, it is difficult to arrest. How dare you talk about arresting Oyedepo or Helen Okpabio in, in Calabar? Helen Okpabio organized um, um, his members of the church, and Leo was terribly beaten. We could not arrest him. We could not prosecute her. But she gave us a package. She sued Leo Igwe and Stepping Stones Nigeria. But fortunately for us, the judge was a Catholic who was also very critical about her messages and gave us, I would say she, he gave us judgment. But actually, we deserve judgment. And um, they threatened to appeal, they've not appealed. Helen Okabe also wrote a book where she called us witches. I went to court. Um, I sued her for libel because she, 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 she labeled me a witch. She said I was demonic. And I lost the matter in the high court. We are on appeal. Why did I lose the matter? The judge is a member of Helen Okabe's church. And usually, the judge should disqualify himself. I wrote to the Judicial Council, and I've not gotten a response. Who knows, the chairman of the Judicial Council is another Pentecostal leader somewhere, and there's connection. And it is, it was, it pained me because she never defended the suit. Okay, and so there's a massive problem with the yes. law. The law is there. You think, do you think it's a good law, but it's just not enforceable? Yes. But okay. beautiful law, no power, will, yes. This power that they, they yes. have. Um, you Okay. Um, first, we have. Uh, first, we have. Uh, we also have the Child Rights Act, actually, in Nigeria, which the feminist organisation tried to uh, to lobby to pass into law. And this Child Rights Act actually protects children against such child abuse, maltreatment, forced marriages, beating, and and all that. But uh, what we actually, I was part of the people that spoke at the parliament when we wanted to pass uh, the, the to have them adopt the bill. But we came. Uh, the problem we came up against was having individual states accept this. They were using the issue of culture uh, and saying that they have to internally, the state has to adopt the, chart, uh, the, the act. And so many of, the, of Nigerian states refuse to adopt the act, especially those in the northern part. Recently, uh, 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 the, the, those in the southern part who were very reluctant, but recently they are passing it with some amendments, trying to change some parts. They feel counteract, uh, contradict their own uh, culture or religion. Uh, so, so it's really uh, pretty a difficult one in the sense of using the law. But of course, there are provisions in the law that says that the fundamental human rights basically comes across, and it's a, it's a, it's a federal constitution, and we can use that pros to prosecute. So I really don't think finding the law to prosecute is the problem. That is not the problem. The, the, the constitution itself is an ample ground to prosecute against witchcraft, uh, child abuse, or what, by whatever name we want to call it. But the main problem comes with the societal attitude towards this. When we look at like the, the case of uh, Bishop Oyedeko, a lawyer tried to take him to court when she I did a video on the uh, Bishop Oyedeko slap, which I call slap some sense into Bishop Oyedeko. More than 80,000 views on it on YouTube. And of course, many causes came with it. I mean, people have given me seven days to die, and the year going on, a year I'm still not dead. So he, he has a lot of followers, you know. But the thing is, the, the man took him to court, but he came, I'm also a lawyer, so I could see the problem he would face. Uh, it was, it, because even in my video I said, we need to take him to court. But you can't take somebody to court in a civil action, because he took him in a civil action without having the consent of the victim. Mm -hmm. The victim did not consent. It, 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 it might have tried to contact the victim, but he went ahead and filed for money for, money for damages without consulting the victim, without having the victim. So the judge asked him, you have taken bringing this case before me, but where is your victim? You're asking for millions of dollars in damages. You need the consent of your victim to bring this case to court. But then let us look at it. Who is the victim? The victim happened to be a 40-year-old, 50-year-old orphan who came to East Church, and I was uh, during the exorcism period. He, the, the people he was, he, she was staying with asked her to go and kneel, kneel in front of Oyedepo and said, confess that she's a witch. Of course, like I said, a societal attitude. The girl got called there, and she was doing that. She wasn't the only one, but she was there and said that, uh, oh, you, you are not, I'm not a witch, but I'm a witch for Jesus. And mind the language, witch for Jesus. I'm a militant for Jesus. I'm Wonder Woman for Jesus. You know? So it took such courage for, for a young girl, an orphan, 
who probably uh, is also being suspicious of being a witch because maybe her parents died or something. And the guidance who brought her from the village were probably thinking, oh, our finances are going down. We must try to get this child that we brought into our household could be responsible for our economic woes. That is the fate of so many orphans. Uh, when you bring them into a new home, they, they become, the, the, the homeowners become suspicious and want to cast out spiritual problems and all that. So the guy said, look, I'm, they've been calling her a witch. So she just decided, I'm a witch for Jesus. And that, that girl got to a angry and said that it's something like witch for Jesus and slapped the girl. And of course, that was very horrible. But they, 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 it, we have it on video, we have it everywhere, but still we couldn't get, uh, get Oedeko persecuted because we couldn't get the consent of the girl. And the parents wouldn't give the consent, the guardians would give the consent. They all this man of God in such awe. And you should also remember that you have the president of the country going to lay down before those people. You have the judges, during election times, you have so many politicians going to lead them, asking those people to pray for them. I call it the, the capitalism of religion. The, the, the pastors are going to make a lot of money out of this. The, the, the presidents are going to get a lot of votes. The pastors have a lot of members running into millions. So if a president can have a pastor to a publicly endorse him, or a political figure, have a pastor, a religious brother, imam, to publicly endorse them, that is millions of votes you're buying right there. So it's basically, and the, the pastor gets it back in contrast, and look at the can Christian Association of Nigeria president, suddenly got a private jet doing his gift, as his birthday gift, from the government, from uh, so, some committee of government and politicians, because they felt all the younger pastors have private jets. I mean, why shouldn't the Christian Association, who happens to be from the old school generation before the prosperity and evangelism, he should also have his private jet, he deserves it. So it, it's a status symbol. So it's a religion of capitalism or capitalism of religion. The pastors, the politicians, those who will prosecute you are also there. And when you talk about wishes, really, you should, somebody was mentioned that of uh, children of the poor. Yeah, it's always children of the poor and all that. But when you have a woman, I have a, uh, I have, for example, I, have, I know a governor who people call his mother a witch. And not in the sense of derogatory term, but in the sense that, oh, he's been able to survive all these attacks. He rose up from being poor to being president of this, to being a big political figure. And now it's because his mother is actually a witch. And anybody who tries to confront his child, he is always there backing her up. So you, you see, if your, if your son is successful, you become a kind of positive witch role model. But if your son is poor, your son is diseased, then you have the old woman. So the, the, rich, the women, the prayers of the rich people are not accused of witchcraft. They are, if they are accused of witch it is it's in the positive role model way. But if you are the poor person, then you are a bad witch, eating and stumbling bulk, causing a stumbling bulk to your, to your children's progress. So it's also a mentality of the, of the society. We have to delve into what constitutes witch and my soul genie, basically. Women, the vulnerable women, vulnerable children. Of course, there was also the case of the boy, who brought Bishop Boy Edeko, also kind of beat up, because the boy said that, if you watch the video, the boy said that, I dreamt of masturbating in my, <laughs> in my dream. Of course, I, he's always masturbating. They said, oh, that is the devil. They, they, they've got to put it in him that it is the devil, and it was all in public in front of thousands of people. And you can imagine Bishop Boy Edeko is somebody with all, uh, uh, many guys, body guys guiding him, and this man with body guys beating up a child, right? Him. And then you have thousands of people applauding. If you want, it's so nonsense because this is what gets me furious. Those are the people who will talk about child abuse and say, no, we are not for child abuse. But right there, they are there clapping when a man surrounded by bodyguard is beating up a teenager. So that is the mentality we have to confront. It's just the last word, actually, what is being done in the UK. I said we are coming for the law, but now what has happened, the government, what it has done, they have now established a national working group on child abuse linked to faith or belief. But also had produced an action a plan to tackle abuse linked to faith or belief. But we are still waiting, we are still pushing for the law. But so far, there has been the action of the government. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I think we need to wrap up because we, uh, we only have the room now. Just a few, a minute or two. Has he got a minute? Okay. Can I give me a minute or two? What time is it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, please. Can you yeah, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for the reactions and questions. And uh, we just have to know that sometimes witchcraft can be used as a metaphor. Yes. And when we use witchcraft as a metaphor, when people are beating up in the villages, they're not using witchcraft as a metaphor. Yes. So, and I want us to understand that distinction. Again, beliefs shape action. 
people's actions that are shaped by their beliefs. The way they react to people sometimes is, the, is their belief that inform that. And uh, I understand that some other people are involved in the campaign in, in, you know, um, in some other ways, trying to address some of the practical actions and abuses. But I think that it's also important that we challenge witchcraft narratives, which we challenge witchcraft beliefs. Because it is these beliefs that it will, it make somebody to abandon the child. So we have to challenge these beliefs, and we have to ask for evidence. And that is what I said. London black atheists, if you are coming out, come out from this perspective. Come out and address this problem from this perspective. That's what I expect from you. Thank you.